Hear the word of God from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. You can find this in your Pew Bible, pages 1 and 997. From Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And now um, we're book ending. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The word of God for the people of God. Forty seconds, a mere 40 seconds. By my watch, that is how long it typically takes to recite the Apostles' Creed at the start of most of our Sunday morning services. Just 40 seconds. It's tucked there usually somewhere at the beginning, you know, in there with the, with the announcements and the opening song and the holy handshake and all of that opening stuff. 40 seconds, it's, it's about 1.1% of a typical Sunday morning around here, which is why it might feel like an afterthought. And, and I know that for many of us it feels like it. I wish sometimes that you all could see what I see when I look at you all. Reciting the Apostles' Creed, mumbling the words staring into sky and slouching off to the side and and that's just me when I say it. <laughs> if, we, if we're honest, I suspect that for most of us, reciting the words of the Apostles' Creed or any of the ancient creeds is downright puzzling. What do these words mean? In some ways, they feel so archaic. And we just get through it at the beginning of the service, and it just feels like an afterthought. Just 40 seconds. Except, except that in those 40 seconds, we remember that embedded in those words is 1,300 years of rich Christian history. That means that for about 5,000 generations of Christians before us, these words have been recited in a settings as lavish as giant cathedrals, to simple, ordinary, one-room house churches, to lonely, isolated individuals struggling in the dark. When you say these words, you are uniting with a rich tapestry of Christian tradition that has spanned the world and spanned over time. That's no mere 30 seconds. The creed is no mere collection of words. Why do we even say the creed? But one might think that we treat the creed like an oath or a pledge, that we recite it at the beginning of services because that's what we do when people get together in public. Is that what it is? Is it like a, a pledge of allegiance that we say at the beginning of a school or civic function? Or is it like an oath that you take if you're a member of the scouts at the beginning of every gathering? Is that what the creed is? We say it as part of a standard opening ritual at the start of our meetings? Our hope, our hope over these next five weeks as we begin a brand new worship series today called We Believe, is that at the end of every service that you will walk out with some, with some insight, not just, a, not just a fuller understanding of what these words mean. That, that when you hear these sermons, you'll hear at least one thing that gives you not just a deeper understanding of these words, but that every time you say the creed, either a traditional one or a more contemporary one, 
you will be able to say these words with the purpose with which it was originally intended, as an act of praise. We remember that the word orthodoxy, after all, can be broken into two parts, ortho meaning right or correct, and doxy, like doxology, meaning praise. To to be orthodox, to remember the traditions of the church, is not to subscribe to some rote, standard, dogmatic set of doctrinal formulations. To be orthodox, to say the creed, is an act of praise. It is the rightest and best and fullest expression of what it means to praise God. And so so my hope is that in each of these sermons, as we go through this creed section by section over the next five weeks, you will be able to say this creed with a fuller understanding of yourself, a fuller understanding of God and your relationship to God, but most importantly, that you will walk out with some motivation to change the way you live. And so today... We begin where we should, at the beginning of the Apostles' Creed. Twelve simple words. That's all that, these, that this opening section is comprised of. The first person of the Trinity is captured in twelve simple words. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. That section is short enough for us to take it almost word by word. The very first thing that we hear about God, the first person of the Godhood, is I believe in God the Father. Now that should be no surprise to us that we affirm God the Father. After all, the phrase Father, the the title Father, is one of the Gospel's favorite labels for God. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that God is male because God transcends gender or that God only has male characteristics. But it reminds us that this God is not a transcendent, distant God, oblivious to our life, but is as close to us as a parent is to a child, as a family member is to offspring. Remember, the the favorite way that Jesus talked about God was with the word Abba, All throughout the Gospels, Jesus calls God Abba, which means Daddy. The most intimate title for a familial connection in the the ancient Near Eastern world. And that's a reminder to all of us that this God that we affirm, this God that we praise, is not distant from your situation or uncaring of your need. This God did not just create you and then set you loose to live your life. This God is your Father your parent, closely connected to who you are. But what's interesting is, that's only the first part of two words that are used to describe God. Not just God the Father, but I believe in God the Father Almighty. Now that should be no surprise to us either, because if if the Gospel's favorite title for God is Abba, or Father, The Hebrew Bibles, the the Old Testament's favorite word for describing God is Almighty. I believe in God the Father Almighty. That word Almighty in in the ancient Hebrew language is the word Shaddai, El Shaddai. Maybe you've heard of that title. That literally means God of the mountain. That's what Shaddai means, a God who is powerful, who's majestic, a God who towers over us to protect us. But we, you know what's surprising about that word Shaddai, that, that word almighty in Hebrew? It's a feminine word. As often as it's translated almighty or God of the mountain in the Bible, you know another way, an equally valid way to translate that word Shaddai? Breasts. Now, I'll leave it up to you as to how the ancient Hebrews could equate mountains with breasts. But what's powerful about that, theologically, is that this God of the mountain, who is powerful and majestic and towers over us, is also a God who nurtures us and provides for us 
and gives us nourishment and provides everything that we need every moment of our lives. This God, who is Father, is also Almighty. This God with male characteristics also has female characteristics. This God is mother and father to us all. A God who is not only powerful enough to protect you, but a God who is caring enough to provide for you whatever you need. You see how powerful these words are? That this just isn't some rote mumbo-jumbo that we recite for a portion of every worship service? Just, just in those first seven words alone are rich, deep theological statements about this God that we worship. And we're only just getting started. To believe in God the Father Almighty means that God is not only beyond you, but also beside you. That's the God you worship. Now the creed could have stopped there. That's really all that we might think is needed to be said about the first person of the Trinity. But there's more. After those first seven words, there's five more to complete this picture of God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now why do you suppose our creed says that? I suppose it's not surprising that the creed affirms the creator of heaven and earth. And after all, the creed begins exactly where the Bible begins. The very first thing we learn about God in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, is that God was creator. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But what does that mean? What does it mean to affirm that God is the creator? And why in the world is that important, so important that the creed mentions it? And why should it matter to us? What difference should it make to you and me to believe that God is the creator of heaven and earth? That could be one of those areas where we're just downright puzzled. When my older daughter Grace was just seven years old, she was reading an old set of childhood encyclopedias. When she looked up at me in the midst of her reading of an article and she said, um, Daddy, I, I just don't get it. She was reading an article about the origins of the universe, an article titled, How It All Began. When she read about the Big Bang and the origin of the universe, she looked up at me and she said, uh, Dad, I, I thought that God created the world. What's this about? Good question, I said. And then I slipped into full parent mode which for me means full dad lecture mode I said well that's a good question there Grace you see and then I explained to her that science and religion are, are not mutually incompatible and how the book of Genesis offers theological language to address the theological questions about the beginning of the world, which, which science cannot touch. And then I said science answers the complex questions about how the universe started with terminology and thought processes that the ancient Near Eastern world was just not a part of and the Bible is not all interested in. I was in full parent mode. I was, I was weaving in everything that I had learned in three years of graduate seminary training with my Master's of Divinity degree and four years of undergraduate work as a biology major. My, my answer was full, it was complete, and it was masterful. <laughs> but as far as answering the inquisitive questions of a curious second grader, at the end of my response she looked at me with glazed eyes. <laughs> and she said, I still don't get it. And the truth is, there's a part of most of us that doesn't get it either. What does it mean to believe that God is the creator of heaven and earth? If I had to do it over again, 
If I had that same conversation with seven-year-old Grace de Vega, I think I'd answer the question differently. I think I'd simply say, science tells us how, the Bible tells us who. I would say the Bible is not a science textbook. It never claimed to be, never has been. Science can answer the how questions about how the universe began. But the people of the Bible, the people from long ago, were not interested as much in the how. They were interested in the who. Those ancient Israelites that first told those stories around the campfire that are now recorded for us in the book of Genesis, those people, those ancient Israelites, were surrounded by empires and cultures that all espoused the same basic idea that there were multiple gods at work all around them, all controlling various aspects of creation. But the Israelites, the Israelites burst onto the scene with this landmark, original idea, an idea that would not only be the basis of all Judeo-Christian thought ever since, but would change the landscape of philosophy for the rest of human civilization. The Israelites said, in the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, a whole bunch of gods. Not in the beginning, a whole legion of gods. They were the first civilization to claim that not only was the universe created, it was one God who did it. So you see, when you say the first 12 words of the creed, you are publicly proclaiming over and against a world that is filled with cultures that would beckon you to bow allegiance to multiple gods that are vying for your worship of a lot of different idols, that you choose to worship the one true God of the universe. Not the God of riches or fame, not the God of self-actualization or self-improvement, not a cosmic butler God, not a vending machine God, not a God who was there to bow to your whims and whistles, not a God of discrimination or division, not a God of hierarchical power structures or one-upsmanship or competition, but the one God, the one God who is both Father and Almighty, the maternal and paternal God, the God who is there to protect you and provide for you, the God who is beyond you and beside you. That is the God and the God who created you who fashioned you in your innermost being, who formed you in your mother's womb, who knows your ins and outs in many ways better than yourself. That is the God you praise every time you offer the first 12 words of the creed, the God who created you. But you know what? There's one more thing. There's one more thing to say about this God who has created you. You see... The creed and the Bible all begin with the same affirmation. Before we learn about God's love or God's power or God's strength or, or that God created, we learn that God created everything. A God who created order out of chaos and light out of darkness and something out of nothing. And what's implied by that is that not only did God create, God is still creating. That's an implied part of this creed. God has not finished creating. God didn't just do seven days of creation and step aside and let the universe spin on its own. God did not finish the creation business. And that's a theme that's implied all throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. Both of these scriptures today talk about a God who is still creating in the words of Isaiah, when the Lord says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? In the book of Revelation, when we see that the Lord is sitting on the throne and God says, I am making all things new. And then in the book of Philippians, my, my favorite verse in the entire New Testament, where Paul says to the Philippian church, I am confident of this very thing 
that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in you until the day of Christ Jesus. It means that God isn't finished creating in you, that God has not left you, that God is not distant from your situation and God will not stop until the job in you is done. And that God will not finish creating something new in this whole broken world. That God is not finished ordering light out of the darkness that we find ourselves in. God is not finished bringing healing to the brokenness and polarization of our tarnished world. God is not finished creating something vital and healthy out of the chaos that we find ourselves in. God is not finished with this world and God is not finished with you. And that's the good news for us today. Right there in the first 12 words of this creed, we remember that God started something good in you from the moment you were born, vivified and symbolized in your baptism. And now, as we prepare to come forward for communion and we feast on that bread and cup, we remember that God is still working in you today. Right there in the first 12 words, we affirm a God who is both Father and Almighty, a God who is powerful and provisional, and a God who is not finished with you. So, in a moment, when you come forward for communion, I will invite you to recommit yourself to praising that God and allow God to work in you to be a new creature redeemed by God's grace. And to prepare for communion... We're going to conclude the sermon this morning with a simple 40 seconds. 40 seconds for us to recite together the Apostles' Creed as our closing prayer, but more importantly, as an act of praise, paying particular attention to the first 12 words. Let us stand together as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed, saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And so as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive a sacrament of communion today and prepare God's tithes and our gifts and offerings, uh, in a moment we'll be inviting the ushers to come forward. And as they do so, I'll invite you to hear this word of thanks from me for the ways that your faithful stewardship every week makes a difference in our community. Because of your faithful giving, we have a ministry to some precious, beautiful souls that are part of our church who aren't able to join us physically every Sunday. They are our nursing home bound, our home bound individuals, but they feel connected to this church because of a new ministry that you help provide called Home Communion. Sally has put together a wonderful team of 14 individuals who every month go to these residences and share communion with them and share a beautiful moment of fellowship. And in that moment, when they are there, making God's love real together in that sacred place, you are there too. Because of your faithful generosity every week, you make ministries like this happen. So thank you for all that you are doing and all you will do today as we invite the ushers to come forward.